All right, let's get this show on the road. One, two, three, roll the cameras. Black against even good from Australia. All right, E4, great. And now the big question, will we finally get an open Sicilian? Still, we won't get an open. So we get an Alapin with black, which I really like because I play the Alapin with white. That's my speed run recommendation. And one of my biggest pet peeves is when, you know, someone recommends an opening and then pretends that that opening wins by force. The Alapin does not win by force. Black has several ways to achieve comfortable equality against the Alapin. But Black has to know a lot. And the line that I'm going to trot out in this game is a line that I really like for two reasons. It's relatively unknown. Uh, three reasons. Black actually fights for the advantage, so you're not just trying to beg for equality. If white misplays it, black is better. And it's relatively sound. White can get a slight advantage, but white has to know a great deal of theory. And it's one of those lines that slips through the cracks. Like, I, I don't see it discussed in too many places. I think a book came out by Lakdawalla that covers it recently, but that's the only thing I know. You start with a move d5, which is the one of the two main moves, but after e takes d5, you don't recapture with the queen. Now, assu I'm assuming our opponent's gonna take. There's no other reasonable moves here with white, yeah. And now we play this move knight to f6. So it's sort of a gambit. It's sort of a gambit. I mean, it, no, it is a gambit. White can keep the pawn with c4. But c4 is a very bad move here um, because black responds with e6 and we get, after the exchange, a typical kind of position that I've talked about extensively across the various speedruns. And we reach that structure in several different Sicilian positions. And I'll recap why black has overwhelming compensation in that resulting position after the game. Let me just write that down. Okay, knight f3. So knight f3, as far as I know, is not a bad move, but it's not the best, not a challenging move. And of course, what is the perp what is the point of playing knight f3? Why are we not taking back with the queen? Well, the point is pretty obvious. We're trying to take back with the knight, which is a more convenient way of taking back the pawn. We keep our queen on its initial square so that the queen does not become vulnerable to various attacks. So we recapture with the knight. That's the whole point of the line. And... I'm assuming that our opponent's going to go, no, bishop c4. Okay, this I'm not too familiar with, and I don't think it's the best way for white to play. So our opponent is developing pieces and putting pressure on the knight. But here I think we have a nice, elegant way to resolve the tension in the center. It's, it's a typical type of move that you find in response to bishop c4 in many different openings, actually. You should just be familiar with this move, because this move achieves a lot. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? So knight e6. e6 is fine, but I don't want to close off the bishop just yet. So of course you can play knight to c6, but then white could respond with d4. The move I'm talking about is actually knight to b6. And you might say, well, why step back with the knight? I mean, isn't the point to keep the knight in the center? Not really. By stepping back with the knight, we're forcing this bishop to commit. And the main reason we bring the knight back to b6 is increasing our control over the d4 square, right? By moving the knight back, we open up contact that our queen now makes with the d4 square. What are we preparing for? We are preparing ultimately for an isolated queen pawn structure, which is going to happen if white plays the move d4. Then we take on d4, and in the Alapin, mostly white takes back. So what's important in an isolated queen pawn structure? It's control of the square in front of the pawn, as I've explained many times. And by bringing the knight back, we are expanding our control over the d5 square. Now, what we don't want to do here with black, we do not want to play bishop to g4. That falls victim to the typical tactic, bishop takes f7, check. King f7, and then the knight jumps out, winning the bishop back. There are several cool things that we could do here. But I really like the concept of developing the bishop to f5 because we want to go e6 here at some point, but we don't want to block out the bishop if possible. So I, I like the notion of going bishop f5. And there is a reason that I don't want to go knight c6 first. If you can envision in your head, after knight c6, white plays d4. So let's say we trade on d4. And then if we go bishop f5 there, 
who can tell me what nasty move we are walking into in that particular version of development? And it's not like overly nasty, but I don't see a reason to allow it. Yeah, well, I can play d5 and we don't have a pawn on e6 yet. So what I really like here is get the bishop out first, then play e6 and then only develop the b8 knight later. Establish control over the d5 square first, then later you can bring the knight out to c6. Um, another positive benefit of bishop f5 is that it, well, it doesn't force white to play d4, but it really encourages it. Because if white doesn't play d4, we can actually stick the bishop on d3 potentially and create the bind on the light square. It's just going to make it very hard for white to bring the queen side out. So it's a challenging move. Castles. Okay, well, our opponent is giving us the option of playing bishop d3. So let's consider it. Bishop d3. From a development standpoint, bishop d3 is a risky move because we're not developing or we're sending the rook to the open file. So let's consider bishop d3. Rook e1. Then we maybe bring our knight out to c6. It's interesting. I don't see anything clearly wrong with it. But of course, the conservative move is just e6. So we can play very ambitiously here with bishop d3. We could play conservatively with e6, and then likely white plays d4, and then we bring our knight out, and we get a normal position. So e6 is the chill move. Bishop d3 is the, like, you know, I am trying to be alpha type of move. But in the speedrun, we try to be alpha, and we try to punish our opponent for opening imprecisions. And so I think we're going to go for the... Well, no, bishop d3 is a tactical flaw, actually. Ooh, this is very pretty. I just spotted something that's wrong with bishop d3. And it's not bishop takes f7 check. I know some of you are thinking that. Because after king takes bishop, why does this one check on e5? The king can move back to g8. And the queen defends the bishop. After bishop d3, there is the immediate knight e5. Threatening checkmate on f7. And attacking the bishop. Not really attacking the bishop, but you don't want to give that bishop away because then white can drop the bishop back to c2 and kick the queen back. So this is kind of a cool detail, and so we don't want to make an unsound move, even though our opponent might not spot knight e5. Let's go e6. We considered it. We refuted it. It's okay. We go with the conventional approach. I'm expecting d4. Playing as white without d4 makes no sense. Knight h4? No, knight h4 blunders the knight. c4. Well, c4 for white is a terrible positional move. That just gives up the entire center. I mean, the white's never getting his queen side out then. Okay, d4 played. So here, a nice little detail. I think a lot of people would automatically take that pawn. But that's an inaccuracy. Why? Why is taking the pawn an inaccuracy? Well, it's because white can take back with the knight. Why is that dangerous? Well, taking back with the knight is very annoying for us because it hits the bishop on f5. We have to move the bishop back to g6. And in that resulting situation, I feel like white can bring the queen out to f3, attacking b7, and we get punished for neglecting our queenside development. So these types of subtleties... As we enter the 16-1700s, like I'm talking about, like the century, th these types of subtleties become very important. And they're not particularly hard to understand, but you just have to be careful. So it's better to, to start with the knight c6. Now, are we afraid of dc? Obviously not. We can just take back with the bishop. And if white wants to trade queens, you know, be, be my guest. Give us the d file. We have a great endgame. So there's no hurry to play CD. I mean, now CD makes more sense because knight takes D4. We can just play knight takes D4. Also, yeah, as Vince Vance points out, as long as the pawn remains on C3, this is one of the drawbacks of the Alapin. The knight on B1 lacks a comfortable developing square. So there is a case to be made for keeping this tension as long as possible and actually just going bishop E7 and castles. We also know that tension makes players uncomfortable, so you should default on the side of keeping pawn tension because that often causes players to make irrational decisions. Ofas asks, is queen to c7 a move? Yeah, queen c7 is potentially possible, but I wouldn't play it here because we're x-rayed. 
or X-rayed, and white actually threatens the move d5. d5 is a very dangerous threat, because knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, queen d5, queen d5. We cannot take back with a pawn or X-ray. So how should we respond to this X-ray? We should respond by developing our bishop. This doesn't change our plan, so bishop e7 breaks the X-ray, develops the bishop, prepares to castle. I don't like queen e Queen c7 neglects c5. Although maybe you can long castle there. That's, a, that's actually a very creative idea. Ooh, that would have been very interesting. Queen c7, and if d5, then we long castle and white can't take the knight because the queen is pinned. But okay, bishop e7 is standard, and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, we've got a good position here. Yeah, g6 would be very bad. Way too slow. And creates dark square holes. No, g6 is terrible in this position. Okay, Lost in the Woods asks, why did we not trade on d4? Well, I did explain that just now. Now, you might be wondering why we didn't trade here. And the reason is that we give the knight the c3 square. And there's no downside to not trading on d4. We can basically do it when we want to. Bishop b3. Okay, our opponent is playing this very well. Let's think here. This is an important position. So the natural... Well, first of all, it's important to realize that white is actually threatening to take the pawn on c5. That is not a pawn we want to just give away. So castling here is, is a bad move. It blunders a pawn. So the natural reaction would be to play cd. Now, cd is a decent move, but again, in addition to white recapturing with the pawn, notice that white can actually recapture with the knight. And if we trade the bishop gets to d4, that's a nicely centralized bishop. It's hitting g7. And our position is still very solid there, but so is white's. And ideally, I'd like to play something with a little bit more pizzazz. And there is a move here that contains quite a bit of pizzazz. It's a hard move to play, though. It's, it's a kind of a hard move to find. But Dark Tiger has found it. So not c4. I don't like c4. Because then it allows white to create a, a big stronghold on d4. I'm talking about the move knight to d5, which we're going to play. And it's one of those moves, like, once I play, you should fully understand why it's played. Technically, we're sacking a pawn, by the way. This move is a pawn sack. Um, but I have a feeling that it's justified. So what is the purpose of this move? Well, it's simple. If white plays dc, then we eliminate the bishop on e3, and then we recapture on c5. If white takes the knight, then we take back with our queen. We get the bishop pair. Now, why is it a pawn sack? How can white actually accept the sacrifice? Who can tell me? It is a pawn sack. Knight d5 is a pawn sack. Takes, takes. Yeah, and then dc. Exactly. Takes, takes, dc. And if you visualize that position, if we take back on c5, then white takes the queen first and then takes our bishop. So we can't do that. And after dc, if we take the queen, then we can no longer take back on c5. But I saw this. And I would classify this as a little bit dubious for black, but potentially very rewarding if white is not ultra accurate. Okay, our opponent trusts us. Knight a3. So you can tell this is a real Alapin player. So he sees, he knows about knight a3. The knight a3 here has lost a lot of its luster because we're so well developed that this idea can be pretty easily parried. So what should we do here? I think we should take on d4. I think the time for us has come to take on d4. Why not a6, because after a6, then white can take on c5. And I'll show you after the game why that ending is really bad for black, while the position after dc here, I think, is quite justified for black. There's a big difference. And I'll delve into that after the game. But what I'll say for now is that because white is now well-developed, dc has become a more serious problem. If we castle, we do not address dc. White can still play dc and win the pawn. The great thing about cd is that it also stops knight b5. So I think the time has come to release the tension. cd. We're also now aiming at the knight with our bishop, so we can play bishop takes a3, ruining white's queenside pawn structure. The downside of that move is that we give up our bishop pair, and I'm not sure we want opposite colored bishops. Creates a lot of drawage potential. So we're playing very simple chess here. But the position is going to get complicated. I'm assuming our opponent is going to take back with a knight, which would be correct. A very bad move here for white would be to take with a pawn. That would give us exactly what we want. It would give us 
like the ideal IQP setup with the bishop pair and a queen not blockading square. Okay, knight d4. So let me think for a couple moments here because we've got several alternatives. Okay. Yeah, there are many ways to play this. And all of them are pretty good, I think. So I'm curious what, what people come up with in, in this type of position. The instinct is for me to ignore, right? You have a bunch of stuff going on, but white doesn't actually really have any threats. Okay, white is quote-unquote threatening to get rid of our bishop pair, but that's not worth crying over because we can take back with a queen and our remaining minor pieces are superior to, white, to, to whites. I mean, the knight is bad. The bishop on e3 is kind of awkward. And we can get control of the d-file later. So we can castle kingside and we can castle queenside, and both moves make sense. I do not like castling queenside. I think that's way too dubious. Castling queenside, I think the white queen could come out to a4. The knight could come out to b5. Why? Why would we seek that, you know, those adventures? So let's be solid and castle the other way. Castle's kingside. I mean, white can play knight b5, but that is totally innocuous. It's one move itis. It just threatens an easy threat to parry. Knight b5, we can even play knight takes d4 if we wanted to. And knight c7 there would not work, as I'll show after the game. Just jot that down. The position is dry. Yeah, the position is very dry. I think we are slightly better. But knowing how to play these types of positions is crucial. You have to know how to outplay people from these toothless, boring positions where neither side has any weaknesses. I think the only reason we're a little bit better is because we've got slightly better placement of our minor pieces. Our queen is active, but that's the only reason. And white should be able to maintain the balance with accurate play. So it, it's very drawish. There's no imbalance. And hopefully, I mean, I can't guarantee that we'll win this game, but how do you outplay people from this position? Well, first of all, we need to see what white does because white can do a lot of different things here. And our next move is likely to be rook f to gate. I'm also eyeing bishop takes a3. Because here bishop takes a3 creates a piece imbalance, and I'm more happy with that than with opposite colored bishops. I'd be more than happy to have a good knight against a bad bishop. Okay, knight c2. Cool. So rook d8 is the obvious move. The queen will come up to e2 there, though. And then white can contest the default rook d1. That sends the game further into a very drawish avenue. So again, ideally, we'd find something that unbalances the position a little bit more, causes slightly more difficulties. You need to be able to ask some questions here and get people to make mistakes. So I have an interesting idea. I have an interesting idea. And I'm just going to play this move, and then I'll explain it properly after the game. Yeah, very good. I mean, Don Brilliance actually pointed this move out. Queen b5. Now, obviously, we're threatening the pawn on b2. And I think a lot of people would see this move and just say, well, what's so great about attacking the pawn? Well, nothing. I mean, I don't think this move wins the game or anything. But we're just starting to ask White some questions. And we're, of course, trying to provoke some weaknesses on the queen side. That's our ultimate goal. So ideally, we're trying to provoke the move b3. Why is b3 a weakening move? Well, b3 weakens the neighboring pawn on c3, and that pawn is very easy to attack. We can bring our bishop up to the long diagonal. And then, you know, the dominoes start to fall on the queen side. So b3 is a bad move. Rook b1 ties the rook down to the defense of the pawn. That seems to be a positive development for us. And it's actually not so easy for white to defend that pawn in a convenient way, if you look at this very carefully. You might say, well, what about queen c1? Well, then we can put a rook on d8, and white has closed off the other rook. Yeah, queen d2 is possible, but then again we can tickle the queen with rook fd8. Queen d2 is a very tricky move. We don't want to take as we get our queen trapped. But queen d2 walks right into rook fd8. Queen b1, woo. Well, that's awkward. I'd love to see queen b1. So hopefully you're, 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 you're seeing that this move is annoying. It's an annoying move. Queen g4, okay. I think our opponent panics. Just classic. Our opponent is completely panicked. I have no idea what he intends on queen takes b2. Because 
it should be obvious to you that bishop h6 can be met with bishop to f6, something people forget actually a lot, which is that this construction with the queen and the bishop, people tend to assume that g6 is forced and that you lose the exchange. But it's not. There are many ways to defend the g7 pawn. I'll show you another example of this after the game. But queen takes b2 is winning. I mean, we just win the queen side and the game. But do you see how quickly players tend to panic when you, when you pose a dilemma like that? Yeah, very good. Bishop f6, queen takes pawn, also defends g7. And that's the best move. Good eye. Very good eye. Now, white needs to, you know, backpedal with like knight d4, but this is already very bad. This is not GG. I exaggerated, obviously. The game is far from over, but it, it's losing objectively. It's losing objectively. What's the rough eval here? If I had to say a number, and people watching on YouTube are probably going to pause the video and like check on Stockfish, I would estimate minus two, maybe. I'm also not very good at computer assessments, but I'd estimate minus two or like minus 1.7. So, like, basically lost. Okay, knight d4. Good job by our opponent to keep his composure. I don't see a single compelling reason why we cannot help ourselves to another juicy pawn on the queen side. We should not take the knight first because then the bishop recaptures and not only does white defend c3, but also threatens mate. So, I mean, I don't see... There's no threat on g7. Knight takes e6, does nothing. I mean, white can attack the queen, but big freaking deal. The queen can move anywhere. Yeah, this is this is borderline over. So knight d4 actually might have been another mistake. I don't know how white should have played there. Yeah, nice bonus move. Is queen steps back to b4, pinning the knight. So the knight can take, but then we win the queen on g4. Okay, rook a c1. Queen to b4. Knight takes c6, queen takes queen, knight takes e7, check. King has h8, and we win. So against queen b4, I am assuming our opponent is intending rook back to b1 in order to target b7. So let's calculate. Queen b4, rook b1. What do we have on tap in that position? Well, we have a very advanced tactical idea there. What should we do in that position? Very good. Queen to a4. Why queen a4? Don't we give up b7? Well, after we give up b7, we could drive our bishop up to f6, and the knight is going to be lost because of the power of the pin against the queen. We just pile up on the knight with everything we got, and we got a lot of ways to do that. We don't even need all those moves, and the knight is going to be lost. Easy calculation. Bang. Yeah, the alternative here, the simpler move, would be queen back to a5, and notice that we have a contact with the, the rook on e1, so white would not be able to capture twice. But queen b4, we are going for more than just two pawns. So let's finish this game off. Let's finish this game off. How do we finish it off? Yeah, e5. I think e5 works. I'm just checking. We have a4. e5, knight takes c6, queen takes queen. We just need to double check because there's a lot going on. E5, bishop, h6 actually exists. E5, bishop, h6. But then bishop, f6. And that position is, you know, you have to be careful there. But it works because anytime our queen is attacked, we can step away to a4. The presence of the a4 square is really important here. Otherwise, if white would have been able to dislodge our queen from the pin, then the knight would have been able to jump into f5, causing... Huge problems to our king. So it's one of those things where you actually have to be very accurate. The margin of error is slim. But I believe e5 wins. And by the way, knight takes knight. The reason I spelled that out is because there are situations, I'm sure you've seen, where it's like, oh, the knight takes another piece and like the queen is forked or something. Or it's mate. I mean, the king it literally has one square in the corner. But you have to calculate that. Okay. What about getting our rooks into play? Well, we have 
bigger fish to fry. We're winning a night. Forget about our rooks. Our rooks can wait. Yeah, it's resignable. I think it's resignable. I mean, I, if I were playing white, I would try bishop h6, force our opponent to find bishop f6, and then play rook b1. And after queen a4, I would resign. Same goes for a3, by the way. Doesn't change anything. Queen a4. Yeah, look how, how much... I mean, we played queen b5 four moves ago. That is staggering. This position and this position occurred four moves apart. So this kind of worked to perfection. This is what I was really hoping would happen because it's a good illustration of the power of these annoying threats. Yeah, now our, our opponent is, is obviously searching for resources, but there are none to be found. White's just too... White's just crumbling here. Bishop d2. Okay, well, this... We can just take the knight straight away, I think. We don't even need to play... We can play queen a4. That, would, that does not hurt. But we can just grab the knight because the... Rook blocks the bishop, and there's obviously no discoveries. Bishop h6 here, we also are attacking the queen. So that does not work. And now we're up a piece and two pawns. The rest is just a matter of realizing our advantage. Queen g3. Okay, so our work is not done. In fact, it's very easy to blunder here. It really easy to blunder here. Bishop h6 is a game-winning threat. If we allow it, we lose the queen. Because there's no way to stop mate and defend the queen at the same time. So the, you know, straightforward move is to move the queen out of the way. Queen e4, queen a4. But if we want to be fancy, then we can also exploit the weak back rank and parry the threat actively. What am I talking about? Yeah, bishop h4, also very good move, actually. But I like the move rook a to d8. Bishop h6, obviously you have queen takes rook. Rook takes rook, rook takes rook, mate. Because white does not have luft. So, and this is a good move because it brings the rook into the game. So it hastens white's defeat. Why rook a and not rook f? It does not matter at all. Does not matter at all. I mean, in this case, either way works. But this is just like the default. I don't know, rook 80, so that the other rook can go to e8. Doesn't matter though. Yeah, if you do your puzzle rush, you just... Okay, h3. So obviously now white reinforces the threat of bishop h6. It's time to respond to it more directly. So... Yeah, again, we have a choice. I would say one option is to move the queen away. The other option is to address the threat directly by sending white's queen away. I like bishop h4. Everybody's suggesting it. It's a direct move. It just forces the queen off of the G file. Doesn't win the game on the spot. Why does queen F3? Then we can continue the torture with E4 if we want to. Yeah, bishop F6. Ah, uh, bishop F6, there's bishop G5. You don't want to play with fire, right? You don't want to, like, unnecessarily allow these discoveries if you can avoid it at all. I wouldn't keep the queen on D4. Even if it technically would work. Okay, queen B3 is blunder we take f2 and then we take the bishop and we win i think white resigns here and we hit 1700 on the nose with this game and i'll share a little bit of theory in the b in the d5 variation just so people have a you know already a weapon against the alpha king h1 we obviously take this bishop over here and easy clap. Queen takes d2. It's over. Over red rover. The term wrong rook comes up in some old chess book, but isn't always explained. Yeah, the question of which rook to put on a certain square. I was thinking of doing in my like next book, like a chapter just on that question. But people make too big of a deal out of that concept. It really is not a game defining question in most at most levels and it's often easier to decide which rook to put on a square than you realize and most of the time you have to decide intuitively it doesn't have to do with calculation it has to do with what you think the other rook is going to be doing and what you think the other rook should be doing let's move the queen away where should we move it anywhere e2 is good keep contact with the rook knight d4 coming in next we don't even need our rook right now we're just using our miners 
Many ways to win this position. The easiest is to try to force a queen trade. That'll make it very straightforward. Yeah, rook d8 to trade is fine. As I always say, when we get these super overwhelming positions, we're up a thousand pieces. Don't just sort of panic when I'm not playing your move. There's like 50 different ways to convert this. I like knight d4 because it does it, it, it encourages a queen trade, but it also sets up mating a potential mating attack. Yeah, there's an interesting concept called mysterious rook moves. I don't remember who coined this phrase. I think it was Nimzovich, actually. And it refers to, like, a stereotypical grandmaster. I did a lecture on mysterious... I wrote an article on them, actually, for chess.com a while back. And they refer to, like, rook moves that move the rook to, like, an, a closed file. And it's like the stereotypical GM move that people are like, I won't understand that move. But if you look more carefully, it can always be understood. Okay, let's finish right off. I think we need our rook to finish right off. So I like the prospect of bringing the rook to c2. Yeah, rook d8 and knight f3 also works, but the king can step away. So I don't love that we're playing without Luft, by the way. So if you're at a beginner level and you're watching this game, a good idea if you're a beginner and you're up two, three pieces is play a move like g6 here. Play a move like h5. Because you essentially put the training wheels on. You ensure that you, you you make a blunder safe mechanism. So it only costs one tempo and it just ensures that you don't blunder a back rank mate somewhere. But because we're playing to our level here, we can safely play without Luft because white doesn't have access to the back rank. Just making sure that rook c2 works. No, there's no queen b8. There's a pawn here. Actually, wait a second. This is funny. Rook c2, there's queen takes b7. Oh, we have a sexy mate there. Let's do it. Oh, man, this is nice. Who sees the mate? Who sees the mate? Queen takes b7, puzzle rush. Not queen takes g2, come on. Queen g2, that's the point of queen takes b7, it defends. No, not knight check. Queen takes the knight. That's a deflection attempt, it doesn't work. Queen f1, very good, queen f1. King f1, rook c1. Back ranker. Because the bishop defends one square on the second rank and the knight defends the other. Would be nice if we finished the game in that way. Bang. Mate. And if you're looking at this and saying, well, I would never spot a mate like this. Well, that's not true. Because doing puzzle rush literally allows you to find mates like this quickly. There's no... I feel like the equivalent is like, you know, nine times seven, 63. How did you solve that so quickly? Like, I, there's no answer. There's no process that you follow to find these types of moves. You just have to develop the pattern recognition. And you have to be patient with yourself that it will come if you do enough puzzles, period. Okay, let's go over the game. Yeah, so this line with knight f6... I remember, like, I faced it. I used to, I mean, I played the Alapin full time when I was like, I faced it when I was 1700 once, and I had no idea what to do against it. I was just worse, and I lost. And ever since then, it, it's been on my radar. Um, and, it's, and it's really underrated. So, a couple of lines to know here. Um, first and foremost, what happens if white defends the pawn with c4? Well, black plays e6. We, we need to get rid of this pawn on d5 in order to unlock the compensation. So we play e6. Okay. White has to take on e6. Then we take back with the bishop. And we've had this exact type of position before in a slightly different line. This is an improved version for white, but white's position, practically speaking, is still not very appealing after knight c6 because we've got control over the square, making it very hard for white to get his pieces out. Where have we had this similar idea? We faced the move f4 a couple of times. And you might remember that the res proper response is d5. You actually do the same thing. Takes the knight f6. Similar concept. And if white plays c4, we have literally had this position in the speedrun before. This is even worse for white because this pawn is sticking out like a sore thumb. But it's the same principles apply. So if we get the position through this line... Well, for instance, knight f3, knight c6, you've got great development, you've got central control. There's like a, 
30 games in the database or so. I mean, some GMs have played this with white, bishop d7. And I like the engine recommendation here, which is actually queen to c7. And this is a very nice move. Because if white plays d4, then you play cd, knight d4, and you win the game by castling. Creating, just, that's it, the game is over. The knight is lost. So queen c7 is a very tricky move, and you make space for the rook to get to d8, a common type of idea. For example, white, let's say, castles. And now you can actually castle queenside, which I quite like, because you've got a big development advantage, and you've got, you know, serious prospect of, of kingside attack. After knight c3, it is important to play a6 here because you don't want to rush bishop d6 and walk into knight b5. You want to throw an a6, then bishop d6, and then you just run your pawns up the board and checkmate white on the king side. Practically, this is very bad for white. Even if the engine gives like a slight edge, you don't care. You can also go h5 and knight g4 and try to get to h2. You've got knight d4. This is really, really bad for white. So c4 is not problematic what are the other moves for white white can play d4 and just continue as if nothing's the matter and here as far as i remember the move is knight takes d5 allowing white to play dc but now you're able to win this pawn back pretty straightforwardly with the move e6 and here what black is doing completely fine i'm um, in this position because if white plays b4 and tries to cling to the pawn, well, you have a very typical way to respond. You want to attack the base of the pawn chain with a5. And white's queenside crumbles. If a3, then you and then you play knight, knight takes b4. You don't mind the queen trade. White is lost here. Can't take the knight because the rook hangs. This hangs, this hangs. White's getting squashed here. So that doesn't cut it. After e6, white can play c4. This looks scary because you have to move the knight, but that's okay. You move the knight back. You don't mind getting the king out to d8 because you've got a development advantage. And if white plays bishop to e3, the knight can further hop into g4, dislodging the bishop from the, its defense of the pawn. Bishop d4, knight comes out to c6. And then if white plays knight f3, then you can push. Well, you, can, you don't have to. You can just take and take. And you win the game. Because white also loses f2. So everywhere you look, black's got some punch to his play. Again, if before you always have a5. And the queen side collapses for white. Otherwise, you take on c5. The king can be stored on e7. And you've got a great position. You can fee and get a light squared bishop. I like this end game for black. So this is quite good for black as well. Knight d5, knight f3 is a line. And we'll look at this in the game continuation move order. This can transpose to what could have happened in the game had white played d4 quickly. So the best move in this position for, for white is bishop to b5 check. Another important idea to keep in your pocket, you're forcing a piece to appear on d7, essentially cutting the contact between the queen and the pawn. The best move for white here is nb to d7, knight bd7. Still threatening to take on d5. And one of the main lines goes d4. And now you have to know this move a6, chasing the bishop. Things get a little complicated here. I don't want to do too much theory. So I'll just limit myself to like one or two lines here. If white takes the knight, then you take back with the queen. And if white takes dc, again, you have to be comfortable playing down a pawn for a while. What you should understand is that you've got the bishop pair, and you're going to probably win the pawn on c5 back pretty quickly. Because again... After knight f3, you already play c, and you know, you know the drill. If b4, again, you play a5. It's like the same thing over and over and over again. So this is not worrisome. The engine move here, after a6, is actually bishop back to e2. This is not an easy move for humans to find. Take back on d5, and white is just supposed to keep developing, and so do you. e6, and this position's equal. I don't think white's got anything here. Castles. And then there's b5, but I like the move queen out to c7, allowing for the knight to jump to f4. Very solid position for black, and this is unique, so Alapin players are going to be uncomfortable here. So that's another line. There's also queen a4 check, which I won't get into right now. You can look at this on your own. The move here is also nbd7. And this is a sharp line, but 
Black is doing fine here as well. So white is able to get a slight advantage here, as far as I know, with the move. I actually don't know what the best move is, according to modern. Well, the engine move is queen a4 check and bd7. This is very uncommon, by the way. And now, at least at a low depth, okay, the engine gives c4. And the point is, if you play e6 here, then white takes, and you can't take back with the bishop. You have to play the awkward fe. So here Stockfish gives the incredible b5, sacrificing a second pawn, but getting a huge development advantage. You get the rook into the game. Then you play e6. And this position is very dangerous for white. It's plus equals. White is better according to the engine. But you're getting your pieces out so fast. The point of b5 is also that you're vacating the fianchetto for the bishop. White could, lose, white could lose control over the position really quickly. Knight f3, bishop d6. For example, d3, you cast. You also have the f file. And this is super fun to play. Bishop b2, bishop b7. Just look at black's pieces here. And if white castles then you're already winning after knight g4. Black's attack crashes through. h3, you take the knight and you drop the knight into h2. Typical motif. Forking the rook and the bishop. Wipe white off the board. So you can dig around here on your own, but this is why I love this line. It's like super sharp, and you can play for an advantage for, with black. There's also queen to b3 in this position. Engine move. And... As far as I know, you're supposed to play a6 with black to prepare b5 and bishop b7. And if white plays a4, you bring the queen out. Knight f3. And you have this move knight to e5. The point of playing a6 is also that you prevent the check on b5. Um, and if white plays knight takes e5, you take back with the queen, pick up d5. And if bishop b2, you drive the pawn into c4. And then you actually give up another pawn. You give it... No, no, you take... And then you throw in the check, and then this comes out, and the bishop gets to d3 with check, and white is losing. So everywhere you look, there are lines like this. And what I would recommend is that you, you know, look at these lines carefully, but also do 10-15 minutes of your own analysis. So look at stuff that you find to be reasonable, but this is just a broad overview. So knight f3, knight c5 is the game continuation, and I think our opponent played... A decent move, but one that doesn't test this at all. If white plays d4 here, then the move for black is, just a moment, the move for black is cd. We, we take on d4. And if white plays cd, then this plays right into our hands. We get an IQP position with our knight perfectly placed on d5. Here I like the move g6. Here we can afford the luxury of Fianchettoing our dark card bishop because white is so passive here. And if bishop c4, then we take on c3 and go queen c7, x-raying the pawn on c3. We have a great position. Black is better. So white, of course, should not take with the pawn. White should take with probably the knight. If white takes with the queen, then we have knight c6. That doesn't make sense. So knight d4. And here we can go knight c6. Um... But we can also play the move e5. This is the ambitious move. And if the knight drops back, then we develop our knight to c6, bishop b5. And we protect the e5 pawn. We are not afraid to play the move f6 here. Why are we not afraid to play f6? Because we can drop our knight back to c7, offering the queen trade. And if white accepts it, black has an excellent endgame. We, we have perfect central control. The bishop comes out to e6. And the knight is very much restricted. We're covering the d4 square. This check is innocuous. Big deal. Just move the king away. Black is doing great here. So this is also not dangerous. The way our opponent played gave us, I think, an excellent position. We go knight b6. And there's a couple of things to note. So to reiterate, why did we not play knight c6 first? Well, it's because after d4... This position occurs, and if we play bishop f5, we allow the extra very nasty option of d5. Don't want to allow this at all. If we play e6, then which is not bad, but we block in the bishop, and we want everything. So that's why we bring the bishop out first, a little subtlety. Then we play e6, and only then do we go knight c6. Now d5 is impossible. Okay, rook e1, bishop e7. 
bishop e3 and knight d5 and definitely i think our opponent in this position played a very inaccurate i think after knight a3 we are we've got a great position i was going to address why well okay i don't even need to address this everybody should fiend kettoing here makes zero i mean g6 just looks horrible here i mean you're just walking into like a gazillion things now you can't go g6 here it's too slow no 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 you got to go bishop e7 so what should white have have done here white should have accepted the sack and here i was planning to play the move rook to d8 or long castle leading directly to this end game which i thought was very interesting because we are threatening to win the pawn back with bishop takes c5 and if white protects it then we can bring the bishop out to f6 and just look at the pressure that we are exerting on white i mean just look at our pieces our pieces are amazing so clearly black has excellent compensation but the engine actually gives knight bd2 and this is where you know when you just analyze with the engine you you get in you get the wrong impression of 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 your play you often get the impression that you played horribly but knight bd2 is a very hard move to find very hard move to find because here you have to see what who can spot why bishop c5 fails it's not impossible, but what what is the point here? Who, who sees it? No, but you have to be able to give the pawn. Yeah, c4 wins. c4 wins the game. Because the rook has nowhere to go to keep the bishop protected. So when I say it, it's easy, but actually finding it is hard. But we would not have taken on c5, obviously. And the engine... According to the engine, we're supposed to play a5 to prevent, because now b4 already becomes a problem. And for and white has actually no good improving moves. Yeah, white, it's equal. The position is equal. If white plays knight c4, then we take. Take, take, check. Here. Oh, this is sexy. Takes. We trap the knight. Trap the knight. So this is equal. I mean, you can offer a draw here. Black may be a little bit better. So, yeah. So this is a justified pawn sacrifice. But definitely white should have gone for this position. When our opponent goes knight a3, he, hangs, he hands over the advantage. C takes d4. Knight d4 castles. And we reach a position that I think is equal if white is careful. But definitely I would choose black any day. Like, I think practically it's harder to play for white. And the key moment in the game, and I actually, this is the top engine move, queen b5. So it's not just a gimmicky one move threat. It is the top move. This is the game winning move, queen to b5. It's this ability to pose, force your opponent to make decisions. So why is this annoying? Well, if white plays b3, we were planning bishop f6. And some of you were wondering what happens if c4. Well, if c4... Then black gets the long diagonal, and we win a pawn simply. Queen a6. The game is not over, but white is collapsing. The rook hangs, and we can safely grab the pawn. The queen is unattackable. And we're up a pawn. Rook is coming to d8. This is great. And as I was indicating, rook b1 is not a move that people want to play, even though it's the only the best move. Here we would go rook d8, either rook. And we would grab the d file. And we're in great shape. Well, b4 is even worse than b3 because this pawn's even weaker. Here, definitely bishop f6. And the queen can drive into c4. So this is this is just terrible for white. So the way white should have played here, according to the computer, is queen c1. But we, we, we again can bring the bishop to f6. Or we can even go knight, knight e5 and try to go knight d3. White has to see a bunch of details like knight d4... And then white can bring the queen up to c2. But then we go knight c4. So it's like, it's unpleasant for white. We're pressuring white's queen side here. So hopefully the move makes sense. Trying to provoke weaknesses. Queen b5. Our opponent just collapses. Queen g4, queen b2. And, you know, white loses everything. Here we take another pawn. And very importantly, after rook c1, we have the game-winning move queen to b4 pinning the knight and what i'll mention is that after rook b1 
we had queen a4. Rook takes b7, and now bishop to f6 with a similar outcome as in the game where the knight is simply lost. Bang, bang, that's it. The knight is lost on d4. So I don't know what is the best that white could have done here. I don't care. It doesn't matter. White is already losing. Um, one of the key takeaways, for particularly for newer players, is that this construction does not force you to play g6. There are many ways to defend the pawn in many cases. This, this, and there is one other motif that is important to put into your mental database of ideas. And it is the following. Well, okay, here's a good example, actually. It's not exactly common, but I just remember this example. So in this position, we have just traded pieces on d4. And my opponent's in some trouble because if she plays, if she moves the knight back, then e4 is lost. So she plays bishop h6, obviously hopeful for g6. Who can spot the winning move? And winning, black wins on the spot here. Really pretty. 98. But why is 98 so good? Because white has to move the knight, and who can spot the follow-up? Bishop h4. Sending the queen away. And then we win the bishop. Exactly. So the takeaway is that you shouldn't just automatically play g6. You should remember that there are many ways to defend this pawn. Sometimes knight h5 works. Here it doesn't because the bishop defends. But you shouldn't, in general, react automatically to certain ideas. You should always remember that there are generally, you know, different defensive methods. So anyways, I could expand on this, but this is what I have for now. And... Once white lost the queen side, well, the rest was very straightforward. We win the knight, and rook a d, it was a pretty, pretty move. Obviously, bishop h6, we back rank mate white. The conversion was very straightforward. I think I explained everything during the game. Any questions? This was a, a, a simple game. Nothing, no frills. I, we, we learned a nice line ag against the elephant, so hopefully you enjoyed the theoretical exposition. If you're watching on YouTube and you're, you know, itching for more theory, we'll get to it. Um, there's a lot of chess left to be played, but you can always analyze on your own and, and fill up your knowledge. We're doing things one step at a time. Other takeaways, the idea of threatening a pawn and trying to force the pawn up in order to create weaknesses is more simple than it appears. It, literally, that's all there is to it. And, and try to be annoying. Try to force your opponent to make decisions because decisions are stressful and people panic. No, there's no good move after queen b5. Like, probably this or this is what white should have played, but look how uncomfortable it is to play a move like this. So moves like queen b5, they don't cost you anything. They don't sacrifice anything, right? So it's a no-brainer to play a move like this because you can always bring the queen back if it doesn't work. But the effect is very powerful. White ends up panicking, and then we win all of his pieces in, like, three moves. Okay, I am exhausted. I will go to bed. Thanks for that. Have a good start to Wednesday. See everybody later. Bye.